All right, guys, welcome to our Let's Play of Thief Deadly Shadows. Uh, this is almost my favorite game in the series. Um, I think Thief 2 ekes it out just a little bit over this one, but um, I'm very happy to be starting this Let's Play. Um, let me just make sure that everything is recording. We are recording. Sorry, I have to check audio too. Okay, so it looks like there was a little audio spike there. That's good. Um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, a really, really excellent game. If you guys haven't played it, I would absolutely recommend checking it out. It is certainly better than Thief 2014, um, which doesn't count as part of the series in my opinion. But yes, we're about to jump into Thief Deadly Shadows. If you guys are wondering why, um, if anyone of you guys following the channel, why I did Thief Gold and now this, so I'm not doing them in order. Uh, I didn't do a Let's Play of Thief 2, but I did do a uh, uh, no commentary walkthrough. So I've played it more recently than this, and I've just been itching to play this game. Plus, it doesn't get cold or rainy where I live very often, and that's just the kind of weather has been making me feel like I want to play this game. So let's jump into it. The recording software really doesn't like the uh, cutscenes, so I'm going to shut up. We're about to start a cutscene and start a new mission so let's get into that oh by the way i am playing what's called the sneaky upgrade now the sneaky upgrade is um it just makes it you know it automatically applies the widescreen patch it fixes a bunch of bugs um it helps it run on modern hardware uh because the original game really didn't like multi-core processors uh so there's a lot of little things that it does uh, to help the game run on modern uh, systems and it apparently fixes some bugs although in testing to get the recording setup for this one i noticed actually more bugs oh and here we go uh we're gonna watch the um the game's uh ad i think the intro which is pretty awesome. I love the intro for all the Thief games, actually, they're fantastic. Uh, so without further ado, let's start a new game, I can I can give you my thoughts on all this stuff. But uh, the recording software really doesn't like the videos, so I don't want to risk having to alt-tab or anything, um, and I don't want to be talking over dialogue or anything either, so let's just go new game. Oh, and another part of the sneaky upgrade is they added mission briefings, which are voiced over in the original, but there's no cutscene for them. On the last day. Betrayer. Excerpt from the Keeper Book of Days. I got a tip last night from my fence. Heartless Perry. A nobleman named Lord Julian had some sort of quarrel and showed up at a local inn well after nightfall and in a foul mood. He's carrying a velvet bag about the size of a man's fist and it never leaves his sight. Sounds likely to be valuable. But I'll know for sure when I steal it from him. Perry sent over a floor plan of the place, the Blue Heron Inn. 
Finding his lordship won't be hard. His room number will be in the guest register, if I can get to the front desk to read it. The inn will have guards, but not as many as a private estate. That should make things easy, which is one of the reasons I'm willing to try it without knowing for sure what the take will be. Lord Julian is so protective of that bag. There's got to be something of value in it. Okay, so we're here to, uh... Oh yeah, sorry, this is the training mission. Where we're gonna break into the inn, find out what room Lord Julian is in, steal Lord Julian's velvet bag from his room, and leave the inn once you have the bag. So we'll be getting into some stuff here. Yeah, so basically this uh, screen is how the missions start in the vanilla game, but in the sneaky upgrade, which is the most recommended fan build of the game, it's mostly just patches. Uh, you can upgrade the visuals, but I'm a purist, and also this I'll be getting into what a great looking game this is and how well some of the things in the game hold up. Hold on one second. Uh, so yeah, one of the things that they added to make it feel a little bit more like the original um, Sorry, I um, just got distracted for a second. Uh, so just like the in the original Two Thief uh, games, if you guys have checked them out on my channel, I've done some playthroughs th of them. Um, yeah, you get you get a sort of well, it's not black and white, but a sepia toned sort of uh, briefing and everything like that, fully voiced over by uh, Stephen Russell with some great uh, illustrations and stuff. They just use screenshots for this because uh, you know. It was probably made by just one dude, and he probably didn't have the time or resources to uh, to do those illustrations. But this is typically how they are. It's just text, I mean, in the vanilla game. And then in the vanilla game, there's a button here that says Start Briefing, um, and then you just get the voiceover as you read it. Um, difficulty, I'm actually going to be starting on normal because it has been a long time since I've played this game. I was checking out the difficulties uh, the other night when I was trying to make get all the recording set up. Um, Opponent sensory acuteness normal. So these are the things I'm actually most worried about and it kind of bothers me because I like that I like the extra objectives on expert. Oh, there is just normal for this one. So we're gonna be doing normal on this one anyways, but um, So just like in the original thief series you get extra objectives around here um, And I love that because it forces you to have to explore the entirety of most of them uh, maps and levels of the game. The problem I have is they actually upgraded a lot of the systems in this game. So the enemy AI wasn't typically that much more difficult in the previous games when you went on expert. It was really just the objectives that got harder, which I actually totally agree with. But, and you had less health too. Um, so I'm fine with uh, damage resistance uh, going down. Um, yeah, that should say player damage resistance. I don't know why it's very low on normal, but anyways, I'm fine with having low damage resistance. Um, the, o the other thing I don't like on uh, increased difficulty is uh, if you go to expert, it says very high for number of opponents. And some of these missions can get a little cramped sometimes um, with certain guard patrols and stuff like that. So I'm just like, ooh, I don't know about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to play most of it on normal. If it feels too easy, I'll bump it up to hard. And if that doesn't feel any different then I'll just throw it up to expert but at least for the first couple of missions I'm gonna keep it on normal because I haven't played it in such a long time and it does mechanically it does play a little bit differently than uh, Thief Gold or Thief 2 which uh, you know gold I played on expert and Thief 2 I'll be playing on expert when I do the let's play for that one so um, opponent combat ability uh, that's fine. I don't care if it's high or low or whatever. It can be maximum. I don't really care. But the sensory acuteness, uh, this game adds, I mean, there were physics objects in the original Thief, and you could alert guards if they dropped or whatever, but it was much more difficult to trip them, you know, like trip over a, a wine bottle or something like that. But this has, every single object in the environment is a physics object. So if you accidentally brush past a chair or a bottle or um, whatever, you know, and, and again, it's not... Like many Warren Spector games, uh, his his uh, uh, his reach exceeds his grasp, and um, uh, there's a bit of jank to it. So I don't want to start getting in. You know, like I basically I'm worried that 
if their sensory acuteness is very high, it's going to be almost impossible to get through the, the levels, but we'll see. So anyways, you can't pick out your gear in this one, which is fine, and we're just going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the training mission. Throughout the rest of the game, you will make your choices and take your own path. In this mission, however, you will be given instructions at every step to get started. Follow the footprints on the ground of the first training experience. Um, so another thing to point out, I don't know if you guys saw the, the loading screen there. One thing that's sort of a downside of using... Um, uh, and let me just turn the brightness up for y'all, because it looks fine for me. It's actually where I like it probably put it at five, but um, I'm worried that after YouTube gets a hold of it with their whatever software they use when they, they encode stuff, um, it's going to get real dark, so. And another thing, to be a thief, you must learn to use stealth. When you hide in the, I'm not going to actually use any of these, sorry guys, I'm not going to read all this stuff out. Um, this is just a training mission, but um, I told him that now. What was I saying way. earlier? I completely lost my train of thought. Lot, but, but um... Just listen to me in the first place. Come on, me with a... Oh, uh, wow. What was I saying? Yeah, that's, that's why I don't like all these, like, tutorial things and stuff like that. It keeps popping up and I lose my train of thought. But, um... Well, let's just get on with it. It'll come to me. Um... Oh, I was just talking about relax. brightness and, and things like relax. that, and I, I don't want it to be too dark. Let me just check. This game also has a nasty habit of take, yeah turning off some of the features when you least expect it, so we're going to turn Bloom on. Bloom actually, the one thing I don't like about Bloom in this game, I, I like the effect, but it actually brightens up some of the light sources. I like the richer color associated with the lighting. I wear my own shoes to work. So, what difference could it possibly make? All right. Actually, <laughs> this training mission is sort of easy and boring as hell, but I really love it. Um, and this game is really associated with winter for me. Uh, a buddy of mine got it for me when I was in high school for uh, Christmas. My best bud. I got him Prince of Persia: Warrior Within because he was a big fan of Sands of Time. And I couldn't shut up about Thief 2 Bloody at the time, so he crack. got me this, because it had just come out. So I played it all that winter. You know? Um, so it's really associated with winter for me. Oh, I forgot. Oh yeah, we can change... Uh, I actually prefer this one in third person, but it's amazing how well the, the first person really works. And I want to point some things out here, guys. Um... This game came out in 2004, and I want you to take a look at this lighting. Like, look at Garrett's shadow, and it's got this great dynamic shadow with a lot of high contrast. Look at the wall there. This is one of the first games that had some sort of bump mapping, or an approximation of bump mapping. If you look at that light source, the texture changes. Um, shading and things like that based on where the light source is and that was a very neat thing in games you know you see like the cracks in the wall seem to have more depth depending on their proximity to the light source if you go up in first person though you'll see that these are just flat textures by and large um, but this was the very beginning of different shading techniques and bump mapping in video games and this game makes heavy use of that and this game is actually utilizing one of my favorite engines, uh, actually my favorite engine of all time, which the funny thing is it's not even an official engine. It's a designation for a family of engines. Um, before Unreal 3 came out, um, people had discovered all these great uh, techniques for uh, better, to, to create interesting lighting effects and better quality graphics. and. We, in 2004, we saw this explosion. We went from games looking like PlayStation 2 games um, and everything having, you know, very sort of even lighting and uh, flat textures and simple geometry to this complexity. Like, this wall, I can't tell you guys, like, when this game came out, this cobblestone street looked like a real cobblestone street to me. And this wall looked pretty much real compared to any other game I had played. And like I said, it helps being in third person. If you go into first, it doesn't look so great. But in third, 
you know, like I said, you know, the light changes how it interacts with the texture the more you go through it. And this just, the, and also the lighting in general in this game is just gorgeous. And it's got a really robust dynamic lighting system that we're going to get into later. Um, it also had higher geometrical complexity to all of the, the 3D models, higher than I had ever seen in a game. And this kind of stuff was happening around this time in 2004. There's just this explosion. You, you, you honestly couldn't believe it. We were going from games that looked approximately like Half-Life 1, maybe a little bit better. I remember the best game, best looking game I had ever run on my system before uh, 2004 was No One Lives Forever 2. Which is a great looking game, but it doesn't look real. It just looks very polished. You know, it's got nice models and uh, nice textures and pretty high res and stuff like that. And it ran very smoothly and everything. But it didn't uh, start to approach realism like this did. And there were a lot of games that came out around this time. Every, like, as I said before, everyone was uh, investigating all these different techniques for how to get this dynamic lighting, how to make textures interact with light better and make them look like they had actual, I don't know, texture, you know, um, experimenting with bump mapping, experimenting with all sorts of stuff like that. So, um, as I said, Unreal Engine 3 hadn't come out yet. And so basically people were taking this, you know, the scripting and things like that, that, that people were discovering in the, in the games industry and applying it to Unreal Engine 2. And so it was sort of unofficially denoted Unreal Engine 2.5 and a lot of very famous games were using it. Um, this game, obviously, uh, this is Unreal Engine 2.5, Deus Ex Invisible or runs on the same engine. Um, uh, Bioshock is an Unreal Engine 2.5 game. Uh, most of the Splinter Cell series uh, is running on the original uh, un Unreal Engine 2.5. Um, more specifically, Chaos Theory, which after this game was probably the best looking game on the market for a very long time. You also had games like Half-Life 2 coming out, which had different graphical techniques that they uh, implemented. Um, Doom 3 just blew everyone's fucking mind. So. You guys cannot believe the gener- I mean, it really- the generational jump that we felt in 2004. Oh, and this game has physics, too. That was another big thing coming out at the time. But the generational jump of the games coming out in 2004 just blew our minds. Like, these gra I never thought I'd see games with graphics like these, and here I was just in my house playing it. And I didn't- I mean, I had a nice system, but it wasn't a beast. So it also blew my mind that I could even run it. And, and all of them came out around the same time. Um, and Doom 3 did different things in Half-Life 2, and Half-Life 2, you know, like the lighting in Doom 3 definitely looked better. Some of the models in Doom 3 looked better. Skin and certain textures looked better. But Doom 3, you know, had like a sort of higher sort of, or I mean, Half-Life 2, certain areas, like especially industrial areas, just were almost photorealistic. Um, so each engine was independently better at doing certain things. And uh, I remember when Fear came out, my buddy was reading PC Gamer and he saw some screenshots and he was telling me he was like, the only reason he wanted to play it was because of the graphics, because it was like all the deficiencies of, of Half-Life 2 were replaced with the more robust aspects of Doom 3's visuals and all the deficiencies of Doom 3's visuals were replaced with the robustness of Half-Life 2's engine. So it was like a perfect marriage of the Half-Life 2 and uh, Doom 3 engine. Um, but a lot of, oh yeah, so Bioshock, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, um, and the rest of, most of the other Splinter Cell games, um, Thief Deadly Shadows, Deus Ex Invisible War, and I used to have a list of games, and here's the thing, they all have a similar look, they all have this really robust lighting system, like look at this beautiful volumetric lighting with this like particle effects and stuff, again with these textures, I mean, it just looked and felt so real, and here we go, there's a, a flame behind this grate, and it's just casting dynamic shadows over the wall, and it just looks gorgeous, and it, it helps with immersion and helps the, the world feel real. Um, so this is, you know, and I honestly think, yeah, look, the models don't hold up super well. The textures are getting a little bit old. Some of them still look great. The floor looks great, in my opinion, still. The walls could use some work. Um, but 
because the lighting system is so robust and because the the models and stuff like that were pretty robust for their time i think this game has aged extremely well plus you know a lot of the people that went into making this game came from looking glass studios looking glass studios folded in 2000 ion storm recruited much of those people around the same time to work on deus ex because that's around the time deus ex came out in 2001 or 2000 i can't remember and um yeah, Warren Spector was... Yeah, I think it was July 2001. So Warren Spector was... Uh, he basically headhunted a bunch of people from Looking Glass that were out of work. So, you know, Ion Storm did Deus Ex, and then the next set of games that Ion Storm worked on were Thief Deadly Shadows and Deus Ex 2. And uh, so basically, a bunch of people that were at Looking Glass Studios, including the sound designer, um, both Brocious's... Uh, Terry and Eric worked on this and, and a lot of the sound team including Eric Brocious came to work on this game so that's why the the soundscapes in this game are just as good a lot of the people who did the writing for the original game worked on this game so this story is fantastic um, oh yeah and I like this lock picking game too so the way it works you can either use your mouse or you can use the uh, WASD keys and I just use the WASD keys so you just find you just keep pressing directions until it starts to the tumbler starts to move, and then you click to to force it into place. And so I like this little mini game. I sort of like it better than the the one in the original uh, Thief games. Okay, let's go over here. Let's knock this guy out. Yep, ragdoll physics, all physics objects in the environment, which was a thing that they were already basically doing in uh, in the original Thief games, and, and basically every Looking Glass Studios game, they tried to have actual physics on all the objects and stuff like that, and after Havoc Physics and a bunch of other stuff came out around this time, in 2004, they just, you know, they just went nuts. And so, yeah, I think every table and, you know, like this chair, I keep pressing the wrong button for no, nope, just pressing the right button. Yeah, see. Lord Julian is in the peony suite. Lord Julian. <laughs> Wouldn't do to have anyone think he was just Julian. Let me read this sign. New no oh my god, dude. Training missions. Just look at this lighting in this game. It's just beautiful front desk. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the Christmas... And here's a weird thing. I don't understand the training mission. So one thing that they added to Thief that I think was fantastic in this one, Thief Deadly Shadows, is you can extinguish candles, but you can't do it in the training mission. So how would you know it in a mission if they're not training you to do it in the mission where you're supposed to learn the mechanics? But I digress. Yeah, um... So the funny thing is, is when I got this game, that Christmas we went up to see some family and uh, we stayed in a hotel that, I mean, it obviously didn't look like a medieval hotel, but it had the same almost exact layout. And they had a little like snack table downstairs. So in the middle of the night, if I was up and hungry, I would, because uh, I'd been playing this game so much, I would try and get down there without being seen by anybody. And so that's another reason I love this little training mission here. Um, and again, here you go, look, like this this fireplace just casting light all over the room. I mean, this lighting looked, and it still looks real to some extent. Again, the only thing really holding this game back are the textures and the, the model quality. But that's about it. I mean, honestly, if you updated those, if you had higher quality models and higher quality textures, I'd say this is almost competitive with stuff that's coming out today. And that's why 2004 was such a huge year for gaming. Honestly, uh, my mind hasn't been blown by a graphical leap as much as the transition from, you know, about 2001, 2002 to 2004. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, yeah, Looking Glass Studios vets worked on this game. That's why, even though they changed up, you know, they went with a new engine, so it's a new engine. Um, they went with third person because Splinter Cell had come out. And the thing you have to remember about people like Warren Spector, Warren Spector especially, because he was on this game, was 
he's very he's not the kind of guy who's just going to keep making the same game over and over again. People bitch about how different I totally forgot this was a thing. I I think it's been forever since I've gone up here. I don't think there's anything that's still Yeah, there's nothing. But I completely forgot you could go up here. Um Deus Ex 2, yeah, people bitch about how different it was from Deus Ex 1, but to be honest, I mean Warren Spector's not the kind of guy who's just gonna keep making the same game over and over and over again. He's he's pretty much said like if I'm not making some doing something new with each game, there's no point. So changing up how the game plays to some extent. The core mechanics are the same, you know, your water arrows sticking to the shadows, not making too much noise. The surface of like wood is fairly quiet, but you don't want to run on it. Carpet is totally silent no matter how fast you move. You have to worry about metal, you still have moss arrows, all that stuff. Um, but you know, now they've implemented 3D physics uh, on all the objects into the environment. They've implemented uh, dynamic light sources um, where you have to worry about where the light source is to stay in the shadow. We'll get to that. There's a part coming up soon, I'll point out. Um, and so, yeah, they didn't want to use that same old engine. They didn't want to just copy everything they did. They wanted it to feel like a new experience. Um, so, you know, people really bitch at the time, but uh, I think it was good. And here's the other thing, too, you know, Warren Spector does not shy away from things that are popular. If he thinks they're stupid, he does, but keep in mind, Splinter Cell was going strong. They had put out two games, and they were both big hits, and they were in this third-person perspective. And, you know, here's another thing, too. Warren Spector was not a huge fan of the original Thief. He does not like being um, told he has to play the game one way. Um, oh, yeah, you can, you, you can do this now. In the game. Like, look, look at that, look at that through the, the window grating. That cast light there. And the color on it too. And the fact that it sort of almost seamlessly blends with the color light in here. So we're gonna go, this was R. That's so you can flatten against walls. It reduces visibility a little bit, but it does mean that if a guard's walking near you, there's a good chance he's not gonna notice you even if he gets super close. Um, so yeah, the decision to go third person was probably inspired by Splinter Cell. I think it works very well in this game. I think it's a welcome addition. And it sets this game apart. Should have gone to sea, like my brothers before me. Yeah, uh, seven. Uh, uh. Oh, all right, what's all the noise about? Peony sweet. It's not stealable, but that is. Is that one? No. So yeah, even though this game is visually different and it plays a little bit different, the core mechanics are still there, and it's really in line with the plot of the others. Actually, that and the the feel, the lore, the plot, the characters, all the original voice actors come back. Uh, as you saw in the beginning, that original cutscene. Um, the sort of animation style that they use for it and everything is great uh, because most of the people that worked on the original series worked on this game too so even though it was done by a different studio it feels like a complete continuation another thing I really like is that the Thief franchise you know it's about the city and the three main factions in the city and whatever sort of hijinks they get up to and in sort of their you know vying for power over the city or or their ridiculous beliefs and so you've got the pagans, and that's what the first game deals with, the pagans and the trickster god, and then you've got the mechanists, or the, the hammerites, and then they get the sort of offshoot um, sect uh, of hammerites called the mechanists, and, you know, sort of their their plot to, to take over the city or whatever, and it deals with the, the hammerite order and the mechanists and everything. And then, of course, in this game, the third faction is the keepers. You've always been part of the keepers. They've always been in the shadows and, and doing things from behind the scenes. And so I thought it was brilliant to be like, oh, there's one faction we haven't explored. So the plot of this game has to do with some sort of something going on with the Keepers and, and their influence on the city and all of that, which I thought was brilliant. And also, I think it really presents... I mean, Garrett doesn't have a really strong arc in this series. It's very subtle and nuanced, but it does present Garrett with a sort of finalizing arc. Um... And it's very clever writing because if you look at his character and, you know, his behavior through all three games, he, he really, at the end of this one, does have an arc. 
you know, and they call back to little subtleties from the other games, so I really like that. So we're going to grab this. Um, I would also like to point out, uh, before we get too heavy into the gameplay and I, I lose track of these thoughts or forget entirely, um, so that the FMV in the, or not FMV, but that, that video in the beginning, um, the, that animation style, if you were ever going to make a thief movie or a thief series, like net series or TV show, honestly, don't go live action. Do that. Because Thief is so stylized and it's so sort of surreal because of the, the sort of steampunk aspects of the world and the addition of magic and and the, the fact that it doesn't it probably doesn't even take place in our own plane of reality. Yeah, don't don't do a live action of it. Do I would say just do an animated and do it in that style. That would be the smartest thing you could do. Um, and I would love to see that. Um, if I won $100 million or more tomorrow, I would start bankrolling. I would get some artists together and you know, maybe call up some old looking glass people and do something. I will, first off, I would just buy the IP from Square Enix. Fuck them. They don't know what they're doing with it. My friend and honored Lord Julian, I will meet you in the Lancaster room tonight. I trust you will be mindful of the risks involved and be generous. Morris, the cook. So His lordship has gone for a walk. Can't have gone far. See, I love this mission because I, you know, right after playing this game for like a ton all winter, I was, uh, I was in a hotel and I would like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I was sort of LARPing, sort of whatever. I was gonna, I, I was trying to see if I could get from my hotel room to the, uh, to the lot or the little snack table near the lobby without being seen. Um, this game made a huge impression on me. Because up until that point, I had played many of the Thief games. I had played Thief, the Dark Project, a big chunk of it. I would played a lot of Thief 2, but I had never actually finished them in their entirety because they were too difficult. I say shift over anyway. But I was really into Splinter Cell around the time years. this came out, so the addition of the... Five picked men with me, and we of the third-person camera He's your cousin, my made it so that I, I won the bet. could easily my play this game. By a thumb's width. The right, bloodline so opal should rightfully be mine. If I may, my lord, I can help you. I know the castle. Well, you're a cook. So, I don't want to talk over them, but... So, another thing to point out here, another thing I love about this game, you're in this, like, nice little cozy room near this fireplace, everything's quiet, and I just love the idea that Garrett is so silent, he's such a good sneak, that he can be in there and just... No one is the wiser, and go right up to them at, while they're at the fireplace and just pluck something off the table. You know, I love that. A little unrealistic, but I don't care. I love it. Um, another thing I love too, if you'll notice here, uh, the shadows behind the chairs near the fireplace are not static. So if I really want to make sure I'm not seen, I actually have to bear in mind that the shadows are not static. They're not set in place and I have to like okay all right you know because of the dynamic light sources and all the great additions to this game so honestly guys it was an interesting time to be alive in gaming 2004 was a big fucking deal and I I guess we sort of noticed it when we were in it but we just felt like oh the industry is just advancing I wonder what it's going to be like in 10 years from now or whatever but you know from from 2004 to 2014 I don't think like graphically I don't think Thief 2014 is that much better than this game and it's you know it's it's running on only unreal 3 oh i guess it's unreal 4 just barely though um and unreal 4 was not a great engine and it had severe optimization problems but all right let's get back to it what could you know so I every look, evening after sunset the, the supply so wagon comes like right through here, that gate and into see? the courtyard i keep going and in and out of darkness so i have to stay with an arrange for your men to be the, inside one evening step lively and then we cut our way through. Five good men against twenty. And my accursed cousin. My lord, listen. There is a passage leading into the castle from the courtyard. I can open it for you when you Go give me here. the signal. The torch in the lion's head sconce. You must put it out. The lion's head torch. Yes. And when I reach the vault and hold the bloodline opal, I will take my place as head of the family. The Lady Elizabeth... We're gonna go ahead and save, just cause this, I, if you don't have a good, cause the, the default controls for this game are gar garbage, if you don't have a good control setup for this bit, it is, uh, tough. Okay, there we go, we're good. 
Close one, but I've still got the goods. So yeah, I, I just like the layout of that mission. I think sneaky upgrade allows you to skip the mission if you want to. Um, but I just like the layout. I just like going through it. It's such a nice little sort of cozy, you know. Um, and it reminds me of that. That was a great winter for me. Um, it was a great Christmas. So it just reminds me. Very nostalgic when I play that. So, all right, let's get to the game proper. And I love this first cutscene. Nothing like mixing in society. Oh, here we go. Especially Sorry. if it comes with good loot. The velvet bag turned out to hold a bronze medallion stamped with a griffin. Valuable enough, but more interesting was the conversation I overheard between Lord Julian and the cook. Especially the part about a huge opal and a conspiracy for stealing it. I'd hate to have anyone but me get a stone like that. But I need a better idea where to start looking. If I show the medallion to my fence, I'm sure he'll know more. Heartless Perry always does. Stephen Russell's voice is like warm honey pouring forth from a velvet bag. I mean, it's just, it's just, oh my god. His voice is just, it, it's not only like he's got one of those, like, he could be on radio, you know, he's got one of those really iconic, but... Also, it's just so weird. He's got this weird sort of New England accent, but without, like, it's not like Boston. And he's like, eh, hey, what are you? Well, I can't do a Boston accent. I'm not even going to try uh, during recording, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's it's not like, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, it's very, his New Englandness is very subtle, and he's got this really interesting diction, too. Um, plus, the delivery you know, when you when you hear him in person, he kind of talks like this. He's like, yeah, thank you for coming to check out. And the fact that he's able to get so baritone and down there for Garrett, you know. And again, I really like, there's something about his diction. He doesn't say Garrett like I do, you know. I got that Arizona sort of non-accent. He says Garrett. And there's a lot of almost, almost British uh, stresses on consonants and stuff like that, which is just, you know. And uh, he didn't say Opal. He says Opal. Opal. He's got all these, like, interesting stresses on consonants. Um, uh, he's got interesting stresses on vowels, too. Like, the way he says again. It's like, like, I say again, right? He says, I don't want to do that again. You know? And it's, it, there's, it's almost British. It's so weird. Uh, and then, of course, just the way, like, Stephen Russell is Garrett. Uh, the animations don't really matter. The even the 3D model in this game, it's kind of a facsimile of Garrett. It's just like, eh, whatever. I guess I get that's fine. You know, I don't love it. I don't hate it. Um, that's not what the character is to me. The character is pretty much just all the voice because everything you need to know about Garrett and his personality comes from Stephen Russell's uh, performance. So it can't be understated how important he is to the character. Um, and he brings a lot to it, and, you know, he he's ha has a sort of noir delivery, you know, if you've ever seen, like, a sort of a, I think Philip Marlowe, yeah, that's the name of the character, or Sam Spade, or something like that, you know, sort of delivery of these monologues, um, but not quite, you know, he's not as world-weary, he's, because he's, he's the predator, he's the thief in the night, you know, so there's sort of a wryness to his delivery, too, as if he's, you know, like, He's sort of smiling while he talks about this stuff because he's got the upper hand. So I don't know. There's a lot of nuance to it, and it's just fantastic. But uh, I'm going to shut up now. We're going to watch the cutscene.
sneaky upgrade. Typically, it just ends with that cutscene. From each of us. The glyphs will desire a different aspect. This is the balance we have struck. Did I say struct? <laughs> Excerpt from the Interceptor's Codex, Volume 8. I had my fence take a look at Lord Julian's medallion. Perry says the crest belongs to the Rutherfords, one of the oldest so-called great families, with a castle in South Quarter and a street named after them. They've got a lot of wealth and a nasty reputation for turning on each other. Based on that conversation I overheard, Julian is definitely carrying on the family tradition. Lord Ember, Julian's cousin, currently resides in the castle, and Julian wants revenge. Julian had a good plan. Hide inside a supply cart and ride in after dark, then signal the cook to open the side door by putting out the lion's head torch in the courtyard. A good enough plan for me to use myself. That bloodline opal sounds valuable, and it's better off with me than sitting around in their vault. But I can't get lazy. Ember will have his personal guard, and doubtless a few other family tricks in store for anyone who comes after the Opal. If I could do any impression, like, like to perfection, like, emulate any voice, it would be Steven Russell. And then I would do, I would work with modders and do voiceovers for Thief fan missions or whatever. Um... <clears throat> All right, objectives. We're going to break into the Rutherford Castle, find a clue about how to locate and open the vault, steal the bloodline opal from the vault, and when our other objectives are complete, we're going to leave the castle grounds the same way we came in. Uh, the cook is waiting for the signal. Put out the lion head torch, and he'll open the side entrance located above the torch on the castle ramparts. All right, so we're going to go... Uh, difficulty as I said, you know if you go up to hard here. I like this. I like it's like okay I get 60% and find at least two special loot uh, An expert 90% and three I think there is only three so you have to find all the special loot and you can you can't kill any non-combatants um, But I really don't like this opponent sensory cuteness very high Opponent combat ability very high. I don't care about that number of opponents though high and then player damage res resistance very low I think on easy. Yeah, so player damage I don't even know why they list this if it's not you always have very low damage resistance. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're going to start on normal. And if if it just feels too easy after a couple of missions, I'll, I'll bump it up, guys. Don't worry. But because I, it's been years since I played through this game, I don't remember if it's going to get, you know. And like I said, some of the AI can be a little janky sometimes. So we'll see. But let's go ahead and get into it. Can't actually buy any gear. We're going to get into this in a second here. But actually, we'll get into this right now. So again, you know, I was saying before, you know, uh, Warren Spector, it's kind of interesting that he was put in charge of this. I think he even said to some extent that, you know, he was not as present as he should have been for the team. And, and maybe it was not, or maybe, no, I think he was saying that about Invisible War. But I think he just possibly felt he was not the right guy to be in charge of this because um, he always had problems with the original Thief. In fact, Deus Ex was largely born out of his frustration with... Uh, uh, playtesting Thief when he was still at Looking Glass Studios, and he said, you know, I can't get that, get past this guard, and you've given me a sword, but I can't fight for shit, so, like, I need something else. I need to fight him or blow something up to get through, and it, like, I just need another way to get past this. And the team was like, no, it's a stealth game, be stealthy. Now, he didn't abandon that principle in this game entirely. We'll get into that. There are some inventory items that show up later. There's things like uh, grease traps, fire arrows, mines, and stuff like that. And those were all in the original game, for sure, but they were very, very limited. You didn't get very many of them, and you had different kind of enemies to deal with. I don't think there's any enemies in the game as strong as the enemies in the Metal Age. And uh, you seldom got them, and they were very expensive. In this game, you can just load the fuck up on inventory. And I'd like to point something out, too. 20 broadheads, 25 water arrows at the beginning of an of a easy mission, it's almost unheard of, you know, if you go back and play the other ones, you, you might have like 10, 7, you know, they don't give you a ton of water arrows, you know, and I think uh, this game is a lot easier largely due to the fact that Warren Spector kind of put his own spin on what he wanted sort of Thief to, 
you know, he, he worked out some of his frustrations with Thief, and it's like I said, it doesn't change up the gameplay too drastically, but the little things like this just giving you much more, uh, much, uh, sort of more filled out loadouts when you go in, whereas the original game was really about, like, you encouraging you to steal more so that you could just afford the few extra tools you needed to get into the next mission, whereas this one, they just load you up with stuff right away. I mean... This is one of the first missions in the game. You're not going to need a health kit. And there's health in the mission. You're not going to need flash bombs. You're almost certainly not going to need a noisemaker arrow. And you're not going to need probably broadheads at all. You basically just need water arrows and a blackjack. I do like the addition of the dagger. I'll see if I can use it at some point. So anyways, without further ado, let's go ahead and start the mission. I don't know if I mentioned the torch. this. Good to see you. Now to give the signal. One thing that Quiet sort of tonight. sucks about the rain earlier. playing this on uh, Black as pitch out here. with an it SSD. Watch. This castle's as old as South Quarter. See the way the stone is? Pulled off an army. Probably has. You really think so? And who knows? It's an old part of town. The streets are all different here. Not like Aldale or Stone Market. Ah, what do you know about it? That. I'm just listening <laughs> to their conversation. Yeah, one of the one of the things that sucks about playing this on on an SSD is there is a lot. It's not just tips, you know, like in Skyrim, but there's a lot of lore in this game that is uh, relegated to loading screens and the like. And so, um, like there's there's some characters and villains that come up later where there's like there's tales about them and nursery rhymes and and all sorts of lore and stuff. And there's it's not out. as much of it is in the I actual hope that cook is as good world, as his word. so you're missing out on a bit of lore because of the... They, they were counting on loading screens taking, I don't know, a minute, two minutes, something like that, before you start a level. Um, and it just doesn't. I mean, you, could, you barely see it. Another thing I'd like to point out is the addition of dynamic lighting allowed them to add this new enemy type into the game. Enemies carrying torches, which in a game that's entirely dependent on you utilizing the shadows to stay hidden was kind of an ingenious move when they're like, hey, we have this extra tech. Is it just to make the game look pretty? No. There are actual real gameplay consequences to putting this tech in the game, which is awesome. Lord Julian was pretty angry. You see his face when he walked out? I wasn't there. Julian's the better man. Oh, don't speak of it. You're a sworn man, fool. I don't like this. Brothers fighting. They'll settle it, you'll see. Okay. A I am going to try and get 100% a, a dancing party. But I'm not going to go in through here. Folk have. What did they quarrel over? I'm going into bed. I love the skybox hawks, of think. the city. I like a good bear it's just like myself. flat, black <laughs> silhouettes with some yellow squares on them. You may think it looks cheesy, but I think it adds to the sort of surreal look of the game. And I really like it. You know, let's go ahead and make a save because I may have to pause or something soon, so I don't want to get screwed here. Can I just... Oh, good. Let's see if it does it again. So, this is how I usually come in. When I was playtesting it last night for the recording, um, I went in through the other way, which is how I used to get in all the time, but I like this window for some reason. Cousin, Ember's efforts to protect the opal go beyond reasoning. He's installed a new portcullis in the cellar, in front of the vault door. As for the mechanism that controls it, my men have searched everywhere with no results. Everywhere but Ember's own chambers, that is. If you find out anything, let me know. Ember readies himself for Julian's return. He keeps his Rutherford medallion always nearby, and not just because of its value in gold. Lady Elizabeth must have sensed something, sensed what is coming. I'm sure you've noted her absence as well. As for us, we must play to whomever is the victor. Our time will come. Above all, beware, Cousin C. Alrighty then. Is Bloom on? I think it's on. I think it just, the game has a gorgeous color palette. Um, in some ways it looks a little more medieval-y. <coughs> than uh, previous entries. Um, which is good or bad depending on what you like about the games. Benwick, ill news from the city. The medallion's missing. Julian cries treason, of course. Which is which of the cousins could have done it? Nestor, P.S. If it's you, tell me. I am with you. It was cleverly done. I 
I don't think I need to move him. I think he's fine right there. I didn't even really need to knock him out, but just in case I end up making noise. Um, and again, guys, it's been such a long time since I've played this that, you know, if you guys are, are more into ghosting and stuff, that's probably not going to be this playthrough because I, you know, I miss exploring some of these levels and I'm going to want to explore them freely so I will be knocking guys out but I will try and keep it non-lethal most of the time except to show off things like um, stealth kills with the dagger which I think are cool um, and also I will do my absolute best because that's how I like to play to not raise any alarms whatsoever so is that I don't think this is the best way to deal with this guy. He's going to see me in that light there. So we're going to go around. And I'm also going to be trying to 100% loot in a lot of these places. So it's going to mean I can't really... Better get into the shadows here. guy gave me some trouble last night. His AI started freaking out. I don't want to put any... I don't want to risk it. I should write a book. A guard's life by me. <laughs> and that's boring. I just wish... Garrett moved a little faster when he's crouched like this. It can be sort of annoying stalking people. It takes forever. Alrighty then. Put that right there. That was another interesting addition of this game we'll get to once we're there that I like and a lot of people didn't when it came out and I just can't fathom why. Yeah, you can't just instantly knock out citizens no matter what. If they see you, they're just like guards. They, they'll freak out. All right, I'm gonna go get him now. I'm gonna get you. There we go. That was very a lot easier than last night. I may have been drinking last night, although I wasn't. I was barely buzzed. So I, you know what? I was also exhausted though. I was very fatigued. So, plus I was getting the feel, and I for some reason didn't want to change the key bindings right away. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, children, ladies and gentlemen, whoever the hell's watching, uh, just don't be an idiot. Change your bindings out, like, immediately, um, when you start a new game. Don't try and, like, just feel, like, even if you're just, I was just doing, like, video and sound tests, but don't, don't fuck around with that shit if it's just not playable. Nestor, I've had the sergeant at arms sacked again. The gilded helm you won at the summer's day tourney has gone missing. Did Julian take it? It's worth quite a bit. Sentimental value aside, Bertram. I also like that you can climb up here and chill out, like Dishonored style. Actually, I guess you could do that in the original Thief games. Um, I've, I've climbed on my share of bookcases in those games. There's, oh, my, one of my favorite levels in this game is the museum. And it's kind of cool because a lot of the artifacts in it are from like Garrett's previous adventures. Um, so it's kind of a trip down memory lane, and it's like the second to last mission, so it's a really great like nostalgia trip, but also, it's got one of the hardest locks in the game. That The rings on the side there, there's like, it, it feels like 20 or 30 of them. It's huge. I found this is the best way to, uh, you've got to stand up, and for some reason you have to hold shift as well, which is walk, but I guess you're putting more force on the object when you walk, for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, that was 
aren't valuable, but this is. Lord Mortimer Rutherford, the Mad, How goes the it, Mad, man? painted by Master Arlick. Nice. Okay, so we got loot in here. I think that's everything around here. This is a great intro mission too. Um, it's a it's a nice layout. There's a lot of really great rooms. I like exploring here. Also, I hope you guys can hear this soundtrack. This is amazing. Uh, it introduces you to many of the most important mechanics of the game. Okay, we'll, we'll go out here later. That's to the, to the next area. I'm gonna start cleaning up guards around this level of the mansion. One thing I was not doing last night was saving. Again, I was just playtesting, but um, it's getting a little frustrating in, in areas. No, oh, I can hear someone coming. I have to say, too, uh, it's not as good as the other games, but the sound propagation system in this game works pretty well. I mean, I knew it was not a good time to go try and get that guard, primarily because of the fact that I. Who struck ah, me? Damn it! Didn't think I'd have to reload so soon. Don't think I think he's coming close. All quiet. Ah, bugger off. So I'm gonna save again just because I'm a little impatient. Uh, guys, in playtesting, I had to redo this mission quite a few times, or play through bits of it quite a few times, so I'm ready to move on. It's gotta be right in the back. I'm gonna get him over here. Quick, 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 quick. Okay. Uh uh. Uh uh. I mean, one part that might be interesting on higher difficulties is having to deal with, like, he's like, hey, where did my buddy go? He was right here. Or, you know, leaving doors open and stuff like that. I'm actually okay with that. That's fine. But it's, um... See, that's this is when it's useful, so you don't have to worry about if they'll accidentally bump into you just, like, chilling in the shadows. See, that's what I'm talking nothing. about with, I don't want to play this you on a higher be. difficulty. There was no reason for him to have noticed me. Um, is that the closest? Seriously? God, I'm fucking... Okay, I'm really going to be safe scumming. No, not safe scumming, but I'm going to be saving a shitload, guys. Don't think less of me. Uh, oh. That's what I'm talking about. And again, I don't know if it's the... I don't know if it's part of the sneaky upgrade or if the AI is just a little janky like that, you know. But basically, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want the difficulty to just get ridiculous, like where I can't even get close to a guard because they just like freak out immediately. Because in the original Thief games, even on expert, none of this should be that difficult. That's probably the one aspect of this game that's not super great is uh, because Garrett moves so slow in creep mode, you know, knocking people out is pretty difficult. There we go. And that's another thing too, when he's crouched, you, uh, he doesn't give you that little indicator, so you just basically have to be like right up on him. We'll just toss this guy here. Anyways, I think this is where we come in normally. Um, 
just going to open, press that. I don't know what that, oh, you know what, I think that opens the, that closes the door over here. Yeah. That's what it does. So that's the, the cook, that, that's why we needed to uh, uh, extinguish the sconce over there or whatever, because we needed to uh, have him open that, so. All guards take note. A portcullis has been installed in the basement in front of the Rutherford Vault as an added protection for the bloodline opal. Only Lord Ember has the ability to open the portcullis. Lord Ember expects his cousin Julian to try for the gem soon. Be on watch for anything suspicious, Captain Williams. Alright, so, again, I'm just... And again, it's not like, oh my god, it's so difficult. I'm saving like this because I'm ready to move on to another mission. I have been... I have already done this almost twice now because the OBS in this game are not friends. Mama, I don't want any more porridge. This guy's sleeping dialogue is hilarious. And I think it's randomized too. Last night it was a different voice actor and he was screaming about bats. So, that's pretty cool. Everything looks good here. And, oh, this area. Fantastic. So, I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead and save again. Get out my water arrows. What's all this? Someone hiding over there? Of course, you can't knock people out when they're uh, suspicious, so I just have to wait for him to, like, to stand up and fight, eh? just chill out, and then I can go get him. And they're still leaning in this game. Oh, shit. Oh, well. I don't think he's going to find me here. Oh, we're hiding, are we? Yes. This isn't a game, you know. Someone probably miles away by now. It's gonna make a hard save. I just I don't have any for this part of this playthrough yet. I don't want to rely just on quick saves. I don't trust data anymore. I had a hard drive crash the other day. I was real pissed. I, I may have lost a lot of footage. I don't know. I can't afford recovery. It's not that important. So, and some of the footage I need is on YouTube, but the the quality is gonna be terrible. You know, by comparison, so. If I can avoid that, I will, but. I don't know what this guy's pattern's gonna be. But yeah, so I'm actually gonna try, believe it or not, repair the drive myself. Um, all I need is to just rip the data off at once. I don't need. Ha! I see you! Damn it. Yeah, I'm really not being patient right now. could do though is go over here and then just wait for him to come over here I feel like he stands in one spot at some point or I may have had to kill him last night I don't remember but um, yeah I'm actually gonna have to try and maybe repair the it's got a lot of my older videos and stuff on it, like the the heart, like the originals, um, and the uh, Adobe Premiere files and stuff like that. What's all that? Ah, you fight like. This is why I'm saving like crazy. I hate redoing all this shit over and over again. And that's what I'm saying. Like the AI is like a little too, you know. A little too squirrely. That's why when they're like, oh, their their uh, sensory awareness is set to normal for you. You want it on very high? I'm like, absolutely not. Let's see, I 
you know, Garrett creeps so slowly that I can barely catch up. You know, by the time I get over here, he's just going to turn around again. There we go. Oh, fantastic. All right, you're done. You're going in the corner. You're going on a timeout. Okay. I love that sound. And I love that they kept it for these games, too. They didn't try and, like, oh, we gotta totally revamp everything about Thief. Okay, so we have save. We're gonna save again. Yeah, like I said, guys, I, you know, um, I'm enjoying this mission, but I have done most of this already, and none of it was recorded or voiced over, so I just want it done now, and I don't want to have to spend hours like, oh, let's try it again with this guy. What does this guy do? Stares at the painting. That's a good opportunity. But I don't know if he's going to stay there. We'll see what he does. Come around again. I think he's going to stay his back. Which way? Alright, got this guy. I think my favorite spot for him is just right about there. I think, here's the thing, uh, you, you may notice I'm not using a ton of water arrows. There's a couple of reasons for that, but uh, if I'm being honest, one of the main ones is the lighting for this game is so pretty, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be like just running around in darkness the whole time. I want to actually look at the pretty lighting. And I could have sworn that there's like jewelry behind one of these guys that I can steal. And there's usually a doorman here, I don't know why there isn't. They may also random. This may be something they do. They may also randomize uh, where guards post up, because I could have sworn that there's a doorman there last night. Like there was a, there was a dude right here. So I don't know. And I always have this memory that there's a there's jewelry behind one of those uh, statues there. Right. Let's see here. Electric lights, the bane of any thief player. showing you guys the Rutherford family vault that opal is as good as mine what does this thing say why can't I interact with it yeah this engine when it's really well illuminated like these textures are terrible and there's no real like bump mapping or anything to give them any depth so and they're also very low res so this looks terrible in here these barrels are you know what octagonal um or how many sides does that have i'm not counting them but you know it it's clearly not round um these pipes look pretty bad close up in first person so you know this game isn't perfect but um uh you know it really depends like some textures are better than others but like when we come up in here, you know, they look a little bit better. Um, but everything looks really good in this game uh, with, yeah, amber light from fire and things like that. The, this wall texture is way better than that one. Um, but everything looks better with soft lighting, subdued lighting, uh, fire light, candle light, anything like that. And it's one of the reasons why, in my opinion, while they run on exactly the same engine with basically the same level of detail for their assets um, why I think that 
Deus Ex Invisible War doesn't really visually hold up as well because I feel like the engine was designed... This game came out first, if I'm not mistaken, and I think the engine and its capabilities were... and their art team were, were more geared towards this game first and foremost, and then they started working on Deus Ex. I know they were developed in tandem, but it just... Invisible War does not hold up as well visually as this does. But, uh, see what I'm talking about with the light on the textures here? Uh, if you look up, let me, uh, go into first person. If you look up here, like, the fact that that has different lighting and shading than down here, um, and so do these. It gives you the, uh, impression that it's three-dimensional, but when you go up close, it's not. It's not. It's a flat texture, so, um, and then, of course, from afar, it looks very good. It looks almost real, so... That was a huge deal back in the day, and this game, honestly, was probably one of the best game looking games I'd ever played when it came out. Typically it's bourbon fuel larceny on this channel, but uh, I have some leftover coffee still. It's a little early for, for the drink. So I'm working on some water and some coffee right now. That's pretty much all I drink. Black coffee, water, and uh, bourbon. And beer sometimes. One thing I am noticing, I think because Garrett's creep speed is so slow, and you have the third person camera, I am starting to get more of the feeling that you are definitely encouraged not to engage every single enemy you see. Because it's actually not too bad to get around otherwise. Could have sworn there was something to steal over here. There is over there. I don't know if I mean, we can't see it yet, but there's something sparkly on the other. Yeah, there it is. See it? You guys see it over there? Alright, let's go ahead and make our save. Lady Elizabeth is a proper lady. She attended Lady Pollock's school for young ladies, and she can run in both ancient brilliant and modern prinkish. Mm. Modern prinkish, you know. Well, say. I guess that's something. Your Lord Ember's knowledge of the world is limited to the names of his ancestors and equine diseases of the mouth. I don't like the way she looks at me, like I've been sneaking about or something. Well, you are a bit unkempt. It's them stairs. She has me up there five times a night, changing the torches. Oh, indeed. I shall inform my lady of your displeasure. Don't you dare. Oh, yeah. In this game, uh, Garrett's mechanical eye, you can actually do stuff with it. You can zoom in and stuff. Although, it's so dark and, like, almost impossible to see that I don't know what the point is. Um, but, uh, you can. It's a feature. <sighs> I'm just gonna leave right there. She didn't need to go anywhere else. Alright, so that's her taking care of loot from under the stairs. And I got this guy's torch, so he's easy pickings as soon as I get a, a nice spot to go take him out. Yeah, we're gonna go this way first. Yeah, like I said, guys, if you had played this when it came out... I love that, too. He, like, he falls over and hits the, the, the stool there, and then pushes the stool. And this was the beginning of, like, ragdoll graphics, and, or ragdollization and stuff like that, when you knock out enemies. You know, it's just little cool things like that that they didn't have to put in the game, but you know, you know, Warren Spector and the Looking Glass people, they're like, well, you can't have a game without physics simulations. Are you insane? And this is Lord Ember. Which way you going, buddy? Which way you going? He's walking kind of drunk. 
I'm walking over Some rats. Some mischief maker turned the light off? Pickpocketing is a little bit more difficult in this game. Uh, I was pretty close. I, I was mashing uh, use on him and I wasn't grabbing that key, so maybe in first person because I can pinpoint it a little bit better. So there's Lord Ember. They can just chill out there. We are going to go... God, I swear to God, there's got to be treasure around one of those. Oh, I don't have to pick his lock because I had that key. I don't think there are any locks that are unpickable, which I do appreciate in this game because I like, you know, that was one thing, it's like, you know, Thief, the original Thief series is supposed to be this great immersive sim, but it's like, you know, when you get to some doors, like, you just have to find the key, and it's like, come on, I'm a thief, I'm a, you know, I've, I can lockpick, like, what are you doing, man? Another medallion. wonder if anyone will pay more for a matched set. And that is the secret thing to open the portcullis. Another little tip for you uh, guys getting into Looking Glass Studios games. Because this pretty much counts as a Looking Glass Studios game. Because like I said, so many people that worked on it were part of the original Thief team. Um, I would say it pretty much counts. In my opinion, it does. Uh, always check under the desks if you're looking for secret switches. Always, 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 always. They do that a lot in this one, and Thief 2 as well. Um, they really go nuts for that. And System Shock 2, yeah. System Shock 2 has a lot of... And System Shock 1, now that I think of it. I think there's plenty of... A couple of desks with some switches underneath them. I'm gonna grab that. Uh, we're gonna read this real quick. Lord Ember's journal. The opal is what's important. Julian will stop at nothing to take it from me, and I cannot become complacent. Even if he subverts the guards, they cannot get by the new portcullis. I alone control the switch, here by my desk where I am safe. This castle is rotten with conspiracy. Were it not for my dear Elizabeth, I'm sure I would have lose my mind. Even the portrait of Mortimer the Mad stares down at me from the stairwell balcony, as if to name me unworthy of the opal. Those eyes, surely Arlick was the greatest of the old masters. I ought to guard it more carefully. It's worth all the other paintings combined. So quiet here tonight. Since Lord Warwick died, there's no one left to talk to. My only friend. Why did you waste away staring at that abominable cursed stone? I'm certain there was some witchery involved. I hear they have donated it to the Wieldstrom Museum and good riddance. Okay, well, that was the clue anyways for the thing by the desk, but it also said there's something about the opal, and the family is going crazy for it, and they're all trying to kill each other for it. Um, there's another interesting thing we're going to learn in Lady Elizabeth's chambers coming up. 50% loot, very nice. I'm just going to go. <laughs> Hope that guard doesn't see me. jump through here as well. Oh, god damn it. Shit, where did I say? Oh, god. No, 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 no. Alright, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a glitch that was, um, present Ugh! on the original build of the game, but not to this extent. So, shit. Alright, so we're gonna go ahead and make a hard save. I should have quick saved after I got all the, that loot. Um, I have noticed this glitch pop up a lot more on this version of the game, the sneaky upgrade. Uh, I don't want to put it at the modder's feet. It may still be a holdover from the original game, but I played the original game a load when it came out, and I do not remember it being that much of an issue. looking in these hallways and just in case there's any loot but I don't think there is any down here so if he comes through here I'm gonna try and knock him out just so I don't have to worry about him yeah this is what I'm talking about like I just need a little bit of a speed advantage so I can deal with guys like this. Oh, 
frustrates me so much. And they took out, as far as I remember, they took out you being able to eat food. Um, we can, you know, it, it seems like such a weird feature to take out, so we're going to try it, but, uh, yeah. So, anyways, I'm going to save. Show you guys something cool, too. I always thought this looked pretty beautiful. I like this little hallway here. Again, you know, first time playing this, these graphics blew my tiny little mind. And uh, I loved this elevator ride. Just looking up like this, these, uh, the lighting. Seriously, you guys have no idea. Lighting just... And you know, honestly, today, there are very few games with lighting this good. I will say this, though. Uh, if you guys have checked out my Cyberpunk review. Okay, we're going to experiment real quick here. I'm just going to Google this. Sorry, guys. I, I just, it's bugging me. Damn it. No, you can't eat stuff in this game. Maybe different food items, but not bread and not cheese. I already tried those, so that sucks. Although I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, there's nothing else we needed in there, but we are going to go up to Lady Elizabeth's chambers real quick. And we're going to save again. Um, yeah, so that thing, basically what happens is Garrett gets stuck uh, when he's trying to mantle something, and then he can't. He gets stuck in what is the falling animation or something like it. And he won't, his hitbox is hovering above the ground, and until there's an impact, he won't go back to his normal state. So you have to be able to drop down off of something. So we're just sliding on the floor there. We need to be able to drop elevation, like fall off of something. And it has happened a lot with me playing around with this level, and it, it happened probably a handful of times when I used to play the game, but it happened, I don't know, already that uh, much. You'll have I forgot there's no yeah it happened uh, probably already that many times at least five or so um, before uh, I mean when I played last night so that just bothers me it's a little annoying and if it keeps happening it might actually be a serious issue I can look into how to fix it, but you know, for if it, you know, if it hasn't destroyed my playthrough thus far, I think it's okay. But you know, I don't want to get to a point in the game where I just get past something really tough, or you know, do some interesting platforming, and then I'm screwed. You know, as you saw right there, like I literally had to drop down to <sighs> ground level to get by there. Yeah, there's issues too with uh, clipping. A lot of clipping issues. Garrett doesn't want to pick up bodies, doesn't want to drop bodies. Uh-uh, uh-uh. See? Um, he didn't want to move over the body, yeah. So, I mean, like I said, the game has a little bit more jank. The, the, the first two are polished to almost a mirror shine. They're really well coded. And then, of course, if you're playing, like, T-Fix and stuff like that, the, you know, modders have been working on those games for, like, over 20 years now. So, you know, yeah, there's just a lot more, you know, they're very polished. This one, you know, sneaky upgrade's supposed to fix a lot of bugs, but, you know, can only do so much. There's the, uh, helm, Julian's helm. Dearest Lizzie, may I still call you that? I remember it from when you were just a child. I'm writing to see if you know of any tincture to help of poor our poor afflicted Clive. He is wasting away, barely speaking or moving, staring at a piece of treasure from his last excursion. The doctors are of no help, and I fear the worst. Little as I wish to, I must beg your help. If not for yourself, do it for Lord Ember. Clive's dear friend, and your, dare I say, betrothed? Or for the memory of your dear mother, who I do remember fondly. Whom I do remember. Yours, Lady Eleanor Warwick. Okay. So her husband's wasting away mysteriously. Lady Elizabeth's Journal, page 52. 
This house is not safe for me. My spy tells me Julian is planning a bloody return. I spend my evenings in the city to avoid this, but I still go armed day and night with a blade and venom. If necessary, I can flee at a moment's notice with the little treasure I acquired from the armory. Until then, I have this sham marriage to make with my sham husband. I care not which of them is it is now. The arsenic will do for either. Ember touched me again today, just on the hand, but it was horrible. Interesting letter from Lady Warwick. Ember's suffering must be exquisite, watching his only friends slowly waste away to nothing. Better than any poison I could deliver. Maybe it's a real illness. Personal stores. Arsenic, sufficient. Atropine, sufficient. Belladonna, gone stale. Cyanide, sufficient. Hemlock, running low. And gypsum weed, require new source. Poisons. Better make sure I wash my hands when I get out of here. Yes, of course we can't forget... <laughs> to do this. <laughs> and always climb on everything that you can, because <laughs> you never know. You never know. Back up just a little bit, Garrett. There we go. You never know what you're going to find. You're going to find, ooh, treasures. 74% loot. I feel like it should be just a skosh higher. I may have missed some somewhere. But we're pretty clear here now, so we can can do a little bit of free exploration to find that uh, last little bit of loot we might have missed. Nothing up here. Let's go back into Lord Ember's Chambers. We may have missed something in there. Something small. I was just playing this earlier doing a playtest and I was at 78 so <laughs> nothing up here I'm surprised I don't remember more of this game considering the inordinate amount of time I spent playing it like a almost disgusting amount it first came out. Okay, I guess that's it. I'm not gonna tempt fate with that window again. Yeah, another thing that's weird that's a little janky in this game is the fall damage can be a tad bit inconsistent, if you noticed. Uh, sometimes it's it's pretty minor, you know, you can fall pretty far and you're, you're pretty good. And then other times it's like, you know, you barely drop um, off of a ledge and uh, you lose half your health like we just did. Because I've done that drop already before because I had the same problem. That's how I knew how to solve it. And, uh... I didn't, ha I didn't take any damage, so, you know, it's not entirely consistent every time. Um, is there any, I don't think there's any loot around here that I missed. No. So I think Garrett's appearance is kind of interesting. Again, Splinter Cell came out, so the idea of a stealth character that's more, I don't know, sort of wrapped up. I think it's interesting they exposed his arms like this. Uh, I don't know why. But, uh, I mean, again, all the all the animations of Garrett, he's got, like, a big cloak on and all this stuff, so it, it's just weird seeing him, you know... Uh, this makes a little bit more sense, but, you know, you're just... We have this visual of Garrett in, like, a cloak. Oh, I hate this guy. It's like one of those guys you definitely need gas arrows or something for. Or just sneak around him, which is probably what I'm going to do. Yeah, I don't think he has anything I need, and I don't think he poses a real threat. Yeah, 
Yeah, the only real threat he poses is you don't want to get caught in here by any of the girls. Um, I want to say you can eat apples in this game, but I'm not sure. No, nope, can't even do that. I'm going to cook it in the fire. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Big leg of mutton or whatever the hell it is. Good save again. Jenny was up all night sewing the new uniforms for Lord Ember. Hands all bloody this morning. And Julian will change them right back when he returns, you mark me. You think he'll come back? I never said that. I never said it either. I think I need to bother with her friend. Uh, who turned that light off? I think she's okay right there. She's pro they're probably not gonna bother me, so. I'm gonna save and then go in here real quick. I love this area too. I'll show you why in a second. Get that goblet. This fleeting suspicion, we're not gonna be getting 100% loot, but you know, I'm not gonna give up hope would be nice. There's the cook. Oh, please they don't could be killing each other right now. Blood on the stairs like the old stories. Like Morton of the Mad. If I had that opal, I'd throw it. Oh. This is why this little oven, I know it's stupid to get so excited about, but I'll, I'll show you in just a sec here. Um, here's what I'm going to do. Gonna hide this guy just in case. But look at that. That's beautiful. Look at that. It's just gorgeous. Dynamic lighting, beautiful firelight, and then you can close it. Again, this blew my mind. We did not have this kind of stuff before 2001, really. Or 2004, I mean. You open it back up and it's still going strong, and then you close it. You open it. You close it. Yeah, I always love this fucking oven. I know, it's ridiculous. But I do. I love it. Is there something on his person that I need to steal? I don't think so. Alright, so... Let's check this. Nothing in this oven. We're gonna go back here. There was like a storeroom or something. And then after that, we're just gonna go for the opal. I mean, we're pretty much done. It's not an overly long mission or anything, but uh... yeah, this is the cook's room. As much as I'm enjoying all the lighting, I actually do need to keep some areas a little bit dark. Cook's journal. My errand into the city is done, but it's for nothing. Julian's medallion has been stolen. If Julian is fool enough to come now, I'll still open the side entrance for him. But I fear the outcome. He'll try to take Ember's medallion, and there'll be blood for sure. If Julian had treated me better, I'd have told him about the new portcullis protecting the vault, and the switch that opens it in Lord Ember's chamber. But I cannot carry on this farce of serving two masters. One way or another, the two dogs are going to fight this out. The sacred... or the scared poodle and the whipped cur. I only hope my part in this is never discovered. If it is, I'll say I never told Julian about the portcullis. Maybe that'll be enough. I was about to say, well, you're dead now, buddy, but he's not. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill anybody so far. Nice. That bowl, we're at 84% loot. I usually get into the 90s. 99, 97. But I don't think I always hit... Uh... There's another piece of loot. Want. I don't think I always hit. Uh...
that coveted 100% on this mission. I think we're good. I mean, I checked that end. There was no treasure there, so I'm going to open this up. You do feel pretty badass once you start getting, you know, good at the lock picking, and you can just breeze through locks super fast. Should I go that way? I don't remember what's that way, so I'm going to go just in case it's something bad. I'm going to go this way. Or wait, did I? I can't remember which way I came from. Kind of be interested to watch a speedrun of this game for sure. Right, we need to make more hard saves. Okay. I think everyone is pretty much dealt with here, so we can go straight for the opal. Although I was expecting to more fi find more treasure there, so I don't know if that opal is going to count for 15% of all the treasure. Oh, this didn't get picked up yet? That's why. Okay, now we're at 90. Fantastic. Great. I was, I was getting a little worried there. I was like, why didn't I not pick up more treasure? What's wrong here? I don't want any more porridge. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything before we open up that portcullis and uh, get into the vault. Because then we're just going to be getting out of here after that. Yeah, nice little easy mission. No muss, no fuss. Like I said, you got to check behind these guys because, like I said, I'm pretty sure one of them has like some coins or something behind him. But I can't be positive, like 100%. And I don't know if there's anything out in the front. This is the front door, by the way. We don't want to go out there. There's two guards. Useless. Cost a fortune too. Better not open that door. Okay. There's nothing here either. I could have sworn. It has been a long time since I actually finished this level. Yep, nothing there, nothing there. Nothing in this little guard area here. I mean, I hope it's worth 10%. It might be, but I wouldn't count on it. All right. Oh, there's another thing to read there, and it's just nothing. I think it's just is nothing. Okay. Nice. Okay, so there's an extra. That's 95. That's 100%. Nice, we did it. 100% of the loot, no muss, no fuss. So this is what they all wanted. Well, it's better off with me. Yeah, some of my favorite missions in all of Thief are in this game. Uh, obviously, the Shale Bridge Cradle, I think that's probably the best horror... bit of horror gameplay in almost anything ever. Um... I think it's just brilliant and fantastic. Um, and then there's, uh, which way are we supposed to go? This way, I think. Yeah, it's this way. What are our objectives? Yeah, we have to leave through the front gate. Okay, so. point to take out that torch and he relit his torch I didn't know the AI could oh no I didn't take his out okay never mind it's like I didn't know the AI could relight the torches that's pretty cool but I guess they cannot I don't want to be spreading fake news I'm 
pretty illuminated here, so I kind of want to get the hell out of Dodge. The blood nice. mine Opal's mine now, and based on the size of this thing, I'd say it was worth it. But something tells me this Lady Elizabeth character had her own plans for the Rutherfords. I'd better get the Opal to Perry soon. He can cut it into smaller stones that are easier to move. And we'll both make a tidy profit. Okay, stats. Opponents killed zero, zero, times caught zero. Uh, let's see if any bodies got noticed. Bodies discovered zero, and I wish the damage taken was zero also. That would be awesome. 2300, got quite a bit of loot from that. South Quarter, one of the city's most crowded residential districts in the center of town, near the river. It's not wall-to-wall -wall nobility like Haldale, but there's money here, if you know where to look. South Quarter's where I live, so I guess this is home. As long as I behave myself, I can go anywhere and do as I please, and the residents won't give me any trouble. But the city watch will. The entire force knows what I look like, and they'll attack me on sight. If I don't stay out of the way of their patrols, I might be looking at some jail time, or worse. First thing I need to do is see my fence, Heartless Perry. His shop is down in Black Alley. I'm bringing Perry the bloodline opal. I don't want to hang on to this stone any longer than I have to. Something about that job has left me with a bad feeling. Okay. Let's go ahead and continue. Very nice. Nicely done. It's not much, but it's home. So this is Garrett's house. I love uh, doing stuff in Garrett's house. Um, I So this is the next sort of part of the game, the next real innovation that they added to um, Thief, was they said, okay, well, as much fun as it is to just, like, go on a new mission and then go on another new mission and then do whatever um, it's uh, wouldn't it be fun to also just let the player loose in the city and just let them do what they want you know break into their neighbor's house break into whatever around the street kind of like the you know little open world aspect of uh, Prague in Deus Ex Mankind Divided um, where you're just free to just do whatever you want in the city. Also, I think these posters are from the original series right there. Um, and, uh, you know, there's like a little training dummy here too. I wish he did the little... But yeah, if you want to practice, you can... And I believe we can practice our archery skills here too. And then, of course, retrieve the arrows. Um, you can actually purchase practice lockpicks. Um, and get better at it. It's usually left for it left for the easy, excuse me, easy lock picks or locks. And then, um, yeah, so it's usually left, right, left for easy locks and whatever. And then you can, you know, do some more archery practice and try and hit it from over here. I think you do have to, yeah, there's arcing in the game. So it's just cool to have like, you know, your little inner, inner sanctum here. And I really like the open world aspect of this game. You know, the fact that you don't always have to be on a mission. You can go through every little... Uh, some quarters are locked off, sort of Metroidvania style, either till the plot makes it uh, possible, or it, it's convenient for the plot, or until you have certain gear to actually access those areas. But yeah, you... Uh, but, but uh, you know, the idea is that you can just go and, and just... Do your thing as Garrett in the city, and I absolutely love it. Does it mean there's a bit of a commute from mission to mission? Yeah. But does it also mean that you don't have to just be funneled into a mission? One of the best missions in all of Thief, or the best mission in all of Thief, is um, 
life of the party. And I think more than the tower, what people remember is basically the mini open world before you get there. There's just tons and tons of rooftops and there are a million different paths to get to the tower and there's all sorts of little side stories and there's things to discover and loot to grab and, and you know, um, you have to figure out how to open this armory vault and all sorts of stuff. There's all sorts of stuff to discover and I think that's why it's stuck in people's minds. So what better way to capitalize on that in a sequel than say like, okay, that's not going to be constrained to one mission. You're going to have free reign to just explore the city and steal and do whatever you want. And I, I think it was really smart. Um, and it adds to the immersion of the game, the immersion of you with the character and feeling like you are Garrett rather than just like being dropped into like whatever missions all the time. So, um, But anyways, guys, yeah, so I just wanted to get to around this part. Um, the next sort of, it's not really like a, a numbered mission, but the next thing we ought to do is make it over to our fence and uh, sell the opal and do some other stuff before we get dropped into the next mission. But um, anyways, yeah, so that was the training mission and the first level of Thief Deadly Shadows. We will be getting back to the rest of it very soon. Oh, and I just wanted to show you real quick, too. We're going to go to the title menu. I'm going to turn off bloom and you get the much richer lighting in here uh, if you'll notice the all the the light sources look a little bit especially these look more orange or darker and I honestly think it's a better look but I do like the bloom effect so I will be periodically turning it on and off as we play the game um, I wish you could just get the bloom effect without um, messing with the color but uh, yeah just so good you know this idea Garrett's just get this like roaring fireplace nice and cozy home to just chill out in I love it um, but I don't want to spoil the rest. Uh, yeah, we're going to be stopping this part of the Let's Play and we'll be getting into Garrett's apartment building, exploring uh, South Quarter. Or are we in Stone Market or South Quarter? I forget. Goals. Objectives. Go to in Bloodline Oak, blah, blah, blah. blah. Well, whatever. I think we're in South Quarter. Um, and, and be going to uh, sell our stuff. Um, so thanks for checking this out. I'm really happy to be finally playing this game and, and sharing my thoughts on it with other people and, and we'll be getting through it. And I know it's a long game, but uh, I'm going to be committed to my the biggest blunder with my Deus Ex uh, Let's Play was not uh, pushing through it. Uh, I will be picking that up again soon, but I really should have just played it a couple hours every night to just get through it so that it could be up and done and then I could start working on a review. So for this one, I'm going to try not to go more than a day without uh, at least doing one mission or something to try and get something up for it. So um, thank you guys for checking this out, and I hope you are enjoying all the Let's Plays on this channel. I hope you guys are enjoying checking out Looking Glass Studios uh, games, especially, you know, um, immersive sims and everything like that. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks for watching.